Wagujika Kasa, Wagujiki Fate. Thank you for joining today's webinar hosted by the SIC Research Institute. Um, this webinar today will begin with a moderated discussion, as always, between our panelists, after which we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A from the audience. So please do be sure to drop your questions in the chat and be sure to include your name and city. I'll be putting some prompts in the chat just to remind you um, to add your questions. I'm really excited for today's conversation. Uh, we were having a chat beforehand and I was reminded that I had a little hand in inspiring maybe some of the folks that are gathered here today. I'm a big fan um, of Angel Mohotra and Adam Safaria's work on their books. I think as someone who, uh, yeah, maybe didn't read or learn about partition until my 20s, I think their work was really fundamental uh, in me being exposed to these stories. Um, and then of course, Dr. Theofan's work has inspired some of my work around intergenerational trauma and how I think about that uh, in clinical practice. So yeah, I'm very much looking forward to how today's conversation weaves together. Before I pass it on to them, I'll do a little bit of an introduction to our panelists. Uh, first, we have Anjal Malhotra. She is a oral historian and writer from New Delhi, India. She's the co-founder of the Museum of Material Memory, a crowdsourced digital repository tracing family histories and social ethnography through heirlooms, collectibles, and antiques from the Indian subcontinent. Her second book, In the Language of Remembering, published in, this April, uh, chronicles the long-term cross-border multi-generational impact of the 1947 partition. Next, we have Anam Zagaria. She is the author of 1971, A People's History from Bangladesh, Pakistan, and India. Uh, also, Between the Great Divide, A Journey into Pakistan-Administered Kashmir, and uh, The Footprints of Partition, Narratives of Four Generations of Pakistanis and Indians, which won her the 2017 KLF German Peace Prize. Uh, and lastly, we have Dr. Shruti Devgan. She is an assistant professor of sociology at Bowdoin College. Her research focuses on the digital, intergenerational, and transnational memories of the 1984 anti Sikh violence. She is especially interested in bridging the gap between academia and wider audiences. She has published in various academic journals and is currently working on her book manuscript on the memories of 1984. Now I'll, I'll pass it on to our panelists. Thanks so much, Manvinder, uh, for those introductions and for getting us started. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. I'd also like to thank uh, Ini Kaur, the creative director of SICRI, and the entire team of SICRI for organizing this panel and inviting me to moderate it. Uh, we're discussing a grim topic today, but I'm really excited to be in conversation with oral historians and third generation descendants of uh, partition survivors and witnesses. Uh, so uh, Anshal and Anam, thank you so much for taking the time for joining us today. Um, I'm excited both as an academic who does work in memory and trauma, but also as someone who's a, a descendant of partition survivors and witnesses herself. So I'm really um, looking forward to this conversation. So both Anshul and Anam are doing the painstaking and important work of collecting oral histories from partition survivors, witnesses, and their descendants. While their work builds on academic and literary documentation and analysis of the partition and its memories, they are pi also pioneers in the field to the extent that they are creating a new consciousness about the partition, especially among the younger generations, by writing for the public and wider audiences instead of simply speaking to academics and other specialists. I think I, I really appreciate that expansive sort of public space that they are creating for these difficult conversations. They're sparking people's curiosity. They're bridging divisions of time and space through their respective memory projects. Um, as you know already, Anshul and Anam come from different sides of the India-Pakistan border, and it's rare to see this kind of cross-border conversation. So uh, I'm privileged to be part of that. Uh, borders and boundaries are artificially manufactured, and yet they assume such immense power and hold over our lives. And in talking to Anshul and Anam today, we'll reflect on how their oral history projects are a product of national borders and boundaries, but also how they transcend them in various ways. So in terms of the format for today's webinar, I'm going to start by asking our panelists a series of questions. I'm going to reserve the last few minutes for audience questions and comments. 
Uh, my apologies in advance if you're not able to address all your questions. I'm sure there's a great interest uh, in this conversation that we're having today. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, uh, but we we should be you know, we don't, we have only so much time. So there's a lot to talk about. And uh, like I said, we have limited time. So without further delay, let's get started. And I, what I'd like to start by with is um, asking both Anshul and Anam about their own personal connection with the partition and how that got them started on these, you know, on their respective oral history projects. So um, Anshul, for this question, if we can please start with you, that'd be great. Thank you so much, Shruti, and thank you so much for having me on this panel. Um, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, in terms of my personal uh, association to partition, all four of my grandparents' families can be traced back to what is now Pakistan. They came from uh, places as far as the Northwest Frontier Province and as close as West Punjab, cities like Lahore and uh, Malakwal. And um, I'm a bit embarrassed to say that uh, I didn't actually know of uh, any connection to partition until I was also in my early 20s. I know Manvinder said that as well, but it's actually quite common. I found that uh, the further you go from, uh, you know, the further the generations move on, the, the more, uh, I suppose, part you carry in asking the question as well. So it's safe to say that only when I asked about this part of my history did I receive any uh, detailed information about migration and that too beginning with reticence. It wasn't easily divulged and the way I started to understand partition history and what became my first book was uh, object history, migratory objects, things that people had carried, things my own family had carried, or very ordinary things like kitchen utensils and pieces of jewelry and small handheld weapons that had been given to them for their journey because they were quite young. Um, because asking the question directly seemed still very difficult. And so I used the aid or the catalyst of an object to exhume those memories. And I think that's really where I started to see what a large part the partition had played in forming the lives of my grandparents in independent India. Thanks so much, Anshul. And yeah, and I think your your work again on uh, material memory and you know trying to trace back memories of the partition through the objects. I think it's it was one of the first projects maybe to have to you know to do that. And I think um, it's just so fascinating and it just there's just so much to unravel. So on the surface, it might look like just an object, but there's just so much. There's so many layers to it. Um, and you do a wonderful job, of course, in your book. Uh, and I hope that I'm sure a lot of our audience members have already read your book, and I'm sure many more will. So thanks for that. Uh, Anam, can we please, um, uh, you know, I'd love to hear about your connection with the partition. So how did you get started on your projects? Thank you so much for the question and thank you so much for having me. A big thank you to the entire Sikri team as well for putting this conversation together. Um, so I grew up in Lahore, I grew up in Punjab and um, there is very much a collective kind of discourse around partition and I did grow up with that. I grew up with my maternal grandmother um, who was in her 20s in Lahore at the time of partition and had volunteered at the refugee camp, um, aiding those who were coming in from across the border in terrible conditions. So she spoke a lot about that th through my childhood and, you know, I, I have very early memories of kind of coming across that violence and bloodshed that so many of us associate with partition. But it wasn't until I actually started doing my first job at the Citizens Archive of Pakistan, which is a Pakistani nonprofit working on cultural and historical uh, preservation, that I really began to understand how little I knew about partition in the sense that there were some stories which are more convenient to national histories and that come forth more easily. And there are a lot of other nuances and realities that get submerged or overshadowed or don't really have that space to emerge. So um, I, you know, as my first job was going into these homes and, and hearing about uh, people's stories of migration or uh, being alive at the time of partition and what they had experienced. And I started to come across these other nuances like 
stories of Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs rescuing each other and so much more joint festivities, you know, in Lahore at the time of Diwali. And something really shifted in me. Uh, and I, at that point, started to also explore more of my own personal history. So I went back to my maternal grandmother. I began to ask a different set of questions. And for the very first time, I began to hear about her own uh, Hindu and Sikh friends, uh, about her childhood, about how her sister was actually saved by a Sikh family in Amritsar at the time of partition. And I just didn't know about these stories. I also didn't really know much about my father's side. And they had actually migrated from Batala at the time of partition. But I lost my paternal grandparents when I was very young. So um, there were those silences alongside that mainstream discourse. Um, and this work at the Citizens Archive really helped me kind of go deeper. And something else that happened at that time, which was very interesting for me and has shaped my body of work is that alongside doing oral history work, I was also uh, in charge of the Citizens Archives Exchange for Change program that was connecting school children in India and Pakistan. So here I was talking to people who were sometimes as old as 112, had lived through uh, colonialism and, and partition. And then I was talking to children who were nine years old. And I started to notice that disconnect as well and how different um, the children's understanding of the past was, how intergenerational memory was shifting. And that made me really curious because this was at a time when, you know, most of us still do or had our grandparents or that first generation around as these walking, talking sources of history. And yet, you know, we're getting so far removed or, or that understanding is becoming so distorted. So I got very curious about that. And that kind of uh, then, you know, resulted in that first um, book project. Yeah. Thanks so much, Anam. Yeah. And I think you do such a great job of, uh, you know, uh, I think again, again, your book might be one of the pioneering books to be doing that, the kind of solidarities and friendships that you talk about, right, which are not really talked about in the official discourse or narrative as much. Um, and you do such a great job of illustrating that with, you know, all this great ethnographic uh, information. Uh, and I, as you were talking, I was reminded of my uh, my connection with the partition as well, because I grew up listening to stories of the partition from my, my paternal grandmother. Her siblings had suffered the partition. And I think that sort of, you know, that there it. There are various reasons for why and why why not people talk about these memories, right? And I think that fact that she had not necessarily directly suffered had in some ways created that space for her to talk about these stories. And I always sort of took it for granted, you know? I mean, of course, the partition happened. Of course, there was all of this violence. But uh, I didn't really start reflecting on it, reflecting on it until I... Um, was in grad school and took a class on trauma and memory. So it's really interesting how, you know, it's sort of, you know, there are families in which it's talked about and uh, and then others not not so much. So there are, there are various ways in which it might work. Um, so if you can talk about, you know, both of your oral historians, if you can just talk about the importance of collecting oral histories, uh, you know, uh, you know, we can think of several things, but uh, I'd be curious to know uh, your thoughts on it. Why do you think it's important to collect oral histories? And for this question, maybe we can start with you, Anam, and then go on to Anjal. Sure. Just on a personal level, I think the kind of learning and unlearning I've had through oral history work has just been transformational. Um, it's changed how I look at my past, how I look at my present, how I look at how the past shapes what's happening today. Um, so I think oral histories have immense value. I think particularly in the context of South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, where uh, the the macro narratives, right, the, the state discourse is so um, divisive, right, where history has become so partitioned. Um, full of distortions and censorships, um, getting rid of anything that's inconvenient to national truths and national projects. Oral histories have immense, immense, immense value because they're offering you something more. They, in themselves, in, in recalling things that states want to forget, are an act of resistance for me. Um, and they also help you move beyond homogenizing narratives, right? Because, you know, Pakistan has a narrative of partition, India has a narrative of partition, Bangladesh has a narrative of partition. And in those narratives, 
we hear one monolithic story and we think that everybody was impacted in the same way. And often it's a selective way, right? So in Pakistan, we'll hear about the violence against Muslims and you know, you change your geographical location and those stories will also change. But what oral histories allow you to do is um, really get to the nuanced experiences and to the wide variety of experiences. And it is through those that I began to realize that you know, a lot of uh, work on partition has been through the lens of Punjab because of the shared degree of violence. But if you go beyond Punjab, they're very different realities. You know, how Sindhis have experienced it, for example, um, how it manifested in different parts of South Asia, how it's ongoing in Kashmir today. Um, you get to understand those realities. You also get to look across class, right, and privilege because that shaped people's experiences at partition as well. You get to understand gendered experiences. You get to understand you know, experiences across caste and so much more. And I think all of that um, is absolutely essential if we really want to come towards a more holistic understanding of partition. But I also think that oral histories are very um, significant because memory itself is not static memory kind of tends to evolve and shape and be reshaped based on who is asking the question and when you're asking the question, right? So if you're speaking to, for example, the first generation and you're speaking to them right after partition, the stories and memories that emerge would be very different than after 1965 when borders became much more divisive after the India-Pakistan war over Kashmir or after 1971 or 84. Right or more recent history, um, you know, 1999, 2001. I mean, I can go on. So memory itself shifts, and so I think oral histories can also reveal that that, that the impact of the present on how we reimagine the past itself. Thanks so much, Anam. That was that was so great, and you talked about so many different things, and I completely. Um, I completely agree. You're talking about stories from below. You're talking about stories, these how these are stories of resistance, but also how there are, there are all these, you know, they're stratified. So it's not like one uniform or homogenous experience for all uh, groups of people uh, and the malleability or changeability of memory, which is also really important to understand. Um, Anshul, if uh, you could please share your thoughts about uh, the significance of oral histories as you see it. I think uh, when I began speaking to survivors about partition, of course, we come from civilizations where history has always been oral. We have hardly ever written down these stories. And, uh, you know, when we start doing this work, we realize how little we really know about our past. And uh, when we do know about it, as Anam said, it is through a very um, narrow lens. It is through the lens of our family, our personal history, our community, our class, our caste. And so, of course, the one thing that oral history does is it allows us to continually unlearn and it allows us to uh, see how partition cannot be just one kind of story. There's no one way to tell a story of partition and there's no one way to inherit or receive it either. I think for me, what was very important when I started doing this work was to notice the absolute incongruence with what I had known about partition in school or what I considered the normative narrative of partition. Because constantly you will find even mundane conversations that challenge it, right? There will, everyone will have a different perspective of partition. And I think often when we speak of oral history, it is looked down upon because it is um, the question that we get more, most often, I think, is how can you prove memory? What is the veracity of your um, recordings, your conversations, your interviews, because they are based on memory. And I think early on in my career, I was very, very interested in defending that kind of question. And now I don't care very much for it. And the reason for that is that oral history may come with its own drawbacks, as do all methodologies. But it's the, the real gift of oral history, where it really shines, is the diversity that it allows for us to capture with these conversations. The sheer subjectivity of oral history is what is its strength. And these conversations with survivors, because the conversations with different generations are quite different. But I think with the survivors, there was a very interesting pattern where I remember, because I, I did interviews in India and Pakistan and then in the diaspora. 
And with everyone, it would start with them in a very similar way that, oh, what can we tell you about partition? We were just common people. We are not Nehru, we are not Gandhi, we are not Jinnah. We don't have anything important to say. And then they would emerge with these incredible stories of human kindness and sacrifice or just the sheer scale of what they witnessed. And I think in thinking about this in retrospect, perhaps one of the reasons for why they didn't consider their story to be initially so valuable was because everyone around them was experiencing the same thing. My grandparents, paternal grandparents, they lived in, in Kingsway refugee camp in Delhi for nearly 10 years, I think. Um, and they didn't think their stories of the camp were important. That was not the first thing they told me. The first things they told me were how they were able to rebuild after partition. Not the smaller details, you know, of what they ate or or what they talked about the first night in the camp. But those were really the things I was interested in. What were you wearing? What were you eating? What was the ration? What kind of identification did you get in the camp? Because these are the, the questions oral history allows you to ask. You are. I was shocked at how people like my grandparents and, and thousands of other people I know had been reduced to numbers. X million migrated, X million killed. So I think that is one of the strengths of oral history. Um, the other thing I think very often about is um, communities that, as, as Anna mentioned, that have been silenced or marginalized by official narrative can speak for themselves. And there is an empowerment in claiming history and using your words to describe your past that I think is very essential. Um, and the last point I think, um, Growing up in a country like India, where a majority of the nation experienced independence rather than partition, I think oral history is beneficial in connecting those people that were unaffected by its trauma to really understanding what it did to people. You know, I, I think that people really empathize with other people's stories. And I've seen this when I've given lectures in places like Bangalore or, you know, Kerala or places that were. Madhya Pradesh, places that were completely unimpacted physically by partition, um, where people really empathize because it is a story of human suffering, human sacrifice, human rebuilding. Um, and I think those are really the connections that stay with people and offer them insights into, into a past that you know they were sort of a part of, but from far away. Right. Thank you so much, Anshal. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, again, you raise so many important points as well. And one thing that I'm thinking about is certainly, you know, and I imagine this is similar in Pakistan, though you can correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong, Anam, this idea of just focusing on independence from the colonial rule. And for, for Pakistan, it be, might be the celebration of the birth of a new nation state. And for India, independence from British colonial rule. But in all of that, uh, you know, partition sort of, you know, for many years, it got marginalized. And I think it's sort of becoming more part of popular memory and popular narrative now. And I think it's fairly recent. The shift, uh, you know, like I was saying before, there is academic work. People like, you know, Urvashi Butalia really, you know, they played such an important part in uh, recording these histories. But in terms of popular narrative, it's still fairly new. And the focus has always sort of been on this triumphalist narrative of how we overcame colonial rule, but you know, not necessarily the suffering. So you're really talking about very important things and the the nuances, the you know, the voices that that we wouldn't hear otherwise, and the voices that don't think that they're important, right? Because they sort of they think of themselves as everyday people, as you know, uh, we don't really have much to say or offer. And it's so great that you're sort of culling out, you know, see these little details about food and what they wore, etc. So that's really interesting. Thank you. The next question I have is actually uh, sort of um, it kind of, you know, uh, in some ways goes contrary to the discussion that we're having, because um, I'm going to ask you about if you have anything distinctive to say about the Sikh community. And I'm asking this question mostly because uh, so we are doing this webinar for the Sikh Research Institute, and I'm sure there's great interest amongst our audience to see if you have anything specific or distinctive that you learned about the Sikh community uh, as you were collecting these narratives that you'd like to share. Um, it might not be a lot. I know that your projects are much more expansive. 
than just one community. But any thoughts that you ho have to offer would be great. So for this one, Anshul, I'll start. So I'm just alternating between the two of you. So I'll start with Anshul and then uh, I'll ask Anam to share her thoughts. So I would not say that I've personally recorded any memories uh, that dis that focus distinctly on one community or the other, because when you go into projects like this, your mind is to is is I guess what's the opposite of divisive? You're breaking divisive tendency. Um, but there have been several instances where I have been challenged on what I considered were normative migration routes for Sikhs. For instance, yes, um, the bulk of the population of the Sikh community did migrate from East Punjab to places uh, in North India like Delhi, Himachal Pradesh, Chandigarh, Ambala, Kant, Kurukshetra. Um, and then there were also migrations to Patna Sahib, which is, of course, on the other side of the country, and large-scale migrations to places like the northeast of India, Shillong, Guwahati, where communities of Sikhs have lived since uh, British Raj, and I think even uh, since the reign of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, there's a particular community of Sikhs that live in the Northeast and continue to do so. Um, and I think the other migration routes that I was uh, interested to learn about were Sikhs who migrated from Punjab all the way to Rajasthan, Sikhs, Sindhi Sikhs that migrated from parts of Sindh uh, via boat, via Rajasthan, coming to uh, other parts of India. Uh, I remember this interview with a woman I'd known for many years who I simply assumed uh, had migrated from Punjab because she was Sikh. And she very gently corrected me saying, no, I'm Nawab Shai Sikh, which comes from the city of Nawab Shai in, in Sindh. And when I did a bit of research, I learned that there are only about 18,000 to 20,000 Sindhi Sikhs that really practice uh, the culture that they were raised with in Sindh. Um, again, to be to be from Sindh, I have learned, is, is far more important than to be uh, Sindhi Hindu or Sindhu, Sindhi Sikh or uh, Sindhi Muslim. But I thought that was very interesting. And uh, I know, Shruti, that your research is on 1984. So I have to bring this up, that the number of interviews with Sikh families that spoke of 84 as being resonant of partition and that kind of very palpable fear that enters someone's voice when they talk about that time as, as having repeatedly experienced something or generations that hadn't lived through partition but were in families where the elders would speak with fear about Esahita, this is exactly how it was staying in houses, you know, for the three days, four days, and the, the cutting of the hair. And I think those, and I, even now, as I'm saying it, you know, there are goosebumps because these, it's so, in, in such recent memory, right? And for people that have witnessed this twice and sometimes multiple times, I think it becomes, um, partition becomes, you know, sort of precedent for anything, uh, communal violence that is continued on in the present. And I think these are also conversations that will stay with me from that community. Right. Thanks so much for for sharing that, uh, Anjul. And uh, and you're absolutely right. Even in my interviews and in my research, um, you know, people talked about even though they had, you know, so this was I, I interviewed an intergenerational cohort of six. And so not everyone had suffered the partition themselves, but, you know, older people in their family had and suddenly it kind of sort of started making sense what those experiences were about. And it also says something about the durability and cyclical nature of trauma, right? That it sort of never quite goes away. There's a way in which it finds its way back and creeps in and, you know, so it evokes something happening today will evoke something that happened in the past and is seemingly disconnected, but is it really? So yeah, that's that's really helpful. Um, Anam, you might have had even less experience talking to six, right? Because your research is mostly based in Pakistan and I imagine the Pakistan diaspora, but, but if you found anything, uh, you know, if, if there's any sort of, you know, um, if you did any interviews or if you have any thoughts about the Sikh experience, I'd be curious to know your thoughts as well. 
Thanks, Shruti. Um, I'll just start there where you both have kind of ended. Um, I think definitely, you know, post-partition events have this tendency to evoke and re-evoke the trauma of partition. And that's kind of what we've seen with the Sikh community after partition. You're a minority and when you try to assert uh, or claim an identity and that identity is seen as a threat to the nation state, right? How how is how is violence unleashed and how does that violence kind of re-trigger memories of partition which you may have tried to put aside um, or not think about because it, it in itself was such you know visceral trauma, right? So I think there's definitely that. But personally, in terms of the work that I've done, um, I have had an opportunity to actually interview uh, Sikhs in Punjab, um, especially during times of pilgrimage um, and and you know uh, when um, uh, Indians have come from across the border to Nankana Sahib, for instance. And I think that loss of heritage that, of course, is shared across communities, but that loss of heritage is so pronounced for the Sikh community. And that is definitely something that kept emerging. I mean, some of the people I spoke to talked about this being their dying wish, right? And how for how many years, decades sometimes, they were actually trying to get that visa to travel across and uh, to stand on that mitti, um, to breathe that air, to be at the Gurdwara. So, so much material, physical, spiritual heritage was lost in the Punjabi identity, as I understand it, is so integral to the Sikh identity and majority of Punjab is then lost. So how do you come to terms with that? There is no closure in that sense. And I think recent efforts to open the Kirtarpur corridor have, le have led to some kind of hope. And I know I've, I've been reading about stories of people actually being able to reunite and meet over there. And I just know how meaningful um, that is. But I also had an opportunity. I mean, one uh, narrative I'll just share um, uh, that, you know, I, I kind of this interview I conducted that's always stayed with me and my book starts with that is of this young uh, boy who was adopted by a Sikh family and was raised as a Sikh boy. And then at partition, you know, the family uh, gave him back in a sense to the Muslim family, to his biological family to protect him. And I met him at this border in Kasur, um, you know, and he was an elderly gentleman at this point. Uh, but um, he continued to dream and and speak to his his children and his family about about that you know that early uh, upbringing and how much he missed his siblings and how much he missed his um, his parents who had adopted him. So I also think that sometimes you know today when we look at um, these stories, we think of them as as Sikh stories or Muslim stories. But what you find is a syncretism and how stories and experiences overlapped, how identities also overlapped so much. And, and, and again, I think that is a power of oral, oral history where you come across these um, experiences that don't really have space in the larger macro narratives. Right. Thank you so much, Anam. That's so powerful and so insightful again. And uh, you know, says so much also about the question of home and belonging, right? So you're seemingly on that side of the border, but is that side of the border your only home? Or, you know, is it, you know, how, what's the other, what's this side, what's that side? You know, it's not it's not as clear cut, it gets very blurry, uh, and especially the emotional ties that you have with this side or that side. So, uh, yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. Um, so, uh, you've both looked at intergenerational transmission of partition memories. You've talked about it a little bit in response to my earlier questions. But if there was one more thing that you'd like to highlight about what you learned about intergenerational memory, um, that I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear about that. So, uh, Anam, uh, can we start with you and then we'll go on to Anshul? Sure, and this is a bit of a pessimistic answer, so disclaimer <laughs> upfront. But um, in my work uh, with with school children, particularly, um, one of the things that I found and been really alarmed by is that our our memory and our understanding of the other is becoming more prejudiced and much more hostile and much more partitioned. And there's, there's a reason for that, right? Um, and other scholars have worked on this as well. That even though partition survivors went through that violence and bloodshed, they also lived at a time when the other was not uh, the other, 
in that sense, right? Um, and that this is not to romanticize the pre-partition past. I don't want to do that because fault lines absolutely existed, but there was a codependence, there was a coexistence, right? So beyond the packaged violence of partition, there, there was more. And so when you probe, right, you will come across these other stories of my neighbor or my school friend, or you know somebody who rescued you or your family or protected your land for decades afterwards after you migrated right so all of that is the reality but children don't have access to that today so when you go into classrooms and when you even talk about oh do you, do you want to be part of this project do you want to be part of this dialogue where we speak to let's say indians on the other side or pakistanis on the other side because i've worked on both sides of the border a lot of times the first response is resistance why would we want to do that right they have been indoctrinated into hatred and it's a very conscious project and against the context and the reality of our divisive borders where people are not able to cross across right uh, i've quoted this study i think in every single interview i've done that gallup pakistan did um, over 70 percent of pakistanis have never met an indian and you know my sense is that the figure is as high um, on the other side. So what you know how how do words and how does jingoism and how do media narratives and hate sentiment in textbooks kind of become the only truth that you know? And how does the other become a monster, right? So I think that uh, for me is really important to highlight because even when I began this work, um, I thought that the further you get from partition the further you are from the trauma and the easier it might be to move on. And I know that a lot of people who want peace hope for that, that maybe now we can finally put that trauma behind us and, and rekindle the relationship or reestablish new relationships. And I'm not saying that that's not happening. I'm just saying that there's, there's a lot of hatred that's being perpetuated um, uh, and you know being fostered and nurtured in society. That is also a reality. But at the same time, um, I think that children have great capacity to absorb anything you give them, right? And they are not rigid in their thinking. And so I've personally, you know, led conversations between Indians and Pakistanis, which have been absolutely transformational, where a 20 minute or a 40 minute conversation would lead to children just saying, but they're just like us, right? Uh, they love biryani too. Uh, when are we going to speak to them again? Um, you know, just a realization that we speak the same language, if, at least if it's North India, um, uh, right? So, and, and those moments are just so beautiful because they deconstruct this large monster that we've created. And I know that in some ways that even happened for me when I crossed the border for the first time. Like, um, it is almost surreal, the, the similarities and the commonalities, right? between particular geographical regions, at least. So I think that in terms of intergenerational memory, lots of really interesting things are happening on one hand, and you are seeing this rise of intolerance and prejudice. And on the other hand, because of social media, because of conversations like the, these, because of new archival work that is happening, because young people are also curious about partition, um, because there are other avenues to bring forth nuances and stories. There's also disruption that is happening. And, and I think a lot of us feel the urgency to do this work because we know what's at stake. We're not only losing the partition generation, we're also losing that nuance with them. And we're going to be left behind with these very myopic um, and censored histories. So uh, that also does give me hope. Um, and so alongside um, you know, the growing hostility, I also notice intergenerationally the, the curiosity to know more. Um, and, and to urgently recover that past. Right. Thanks so much, Anam. And I think that reality check and acknowledging this, you know, sort of uh, hostility is really important, right? Because unless you acknowledge and address it, uh, how, how can you possibly, you know, tell a different story? And that's so remarkable that you're sort of also doing this work of, uh, you know, shifting the narrative for the younger generation. So it's not a lost project, like you're saying. So even though there are these uh, sentiments of hostility, it's not a lost project. And you're right that so many of us, if it wasn't for the fact that, so I grew up in India and I was there for the first 25 years of my life. If it if I hadn't moved to the US, I'm fairly certain that I would not have met a Pakistani ever. And 
I'm not sure. I think there were there are these sort of you know uh, subtle hidden bias. We would like to think of ourselves as you know free of biases and you know just these completely tol tolerant people. But the official discourse is such that you kind of internalize it. And now my closest friends, one of my closest friends here, um, is from Pakistan, and she just so we I'm in Maine, and she was in Maine, and she just left Maine and. You know, I miss her so much, but there is no difference, right? I mean, it's just so, again, it's just so artificially created and yet it's so important uh, in terms of how people internalize it. So yeah, thanks so much for that, Anand. Um, Anshul, can, can you talk about, you know, intergenerational, so your latest project is about intergenerational memory, right? And uh, there's been a lot of buzz around it. So if you can talk a little bit about what you discovered and would like to share. I think part of the reason to actually, um, pursue the project for as long as I did was to know whether partition is still relevant with younger generations. And why was it that someone like me was so obsessed with it? Because I hadn't lived it. And yet for the last decade, this is all I've talked about and thought about and dreamt about and written about. And I think for many of us who work on partition, um, we are subsequent generations uh, of partition families. We are descendants. We are inheritors. And um, the, I guess the one, I'll start with what I've learned. The one like big takeaway I think is to understand that intergenerational transmission where one person's, uh, one generation story is told in a way that it can impact another generation's present or even their understanding of the past or the way they shape their future. I think that has been resounding throughout because I've seen it happen in multiple locations, not just India, in Pakistan, within Bangladeshi families, within the diaspora that live with multi-hyphenated identities. And I think that has been uh, quite illuminating to see because um, the vocabulary of partition is so limited. We don't know how to talk about it as descendant generations. We are not given a vocabulary of trauma. We are not given a vocabulary of oneness or even... I mean, I guess the vocabulary of othering is what is most normal. However, um, for countries like Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh that have been born out of essentially violence, it seems absurd that where there is space and language for nostalgia and longing, space for other things does not seem to find place. Um, and these things, like talking about violence or talking about things that were witnessed or even talking about partition. There is such difficulty in starting that conversation within families and it needs to be exhumed with delicacy often over a period of time. So there is not only the difficulty on the part of the survivor in, in uttering what happened, but also the it, sort of incapability of the descendant to demand that emotional sedimentation of partition. Um, I was raised... I don't think I was ever raised with stories of partition. I was raised with knowing how much was lost when things changed or when my family migrated. And that word partition was never really used. Neither was the word Pakistan. The word that was used was refugee. And it was used often because my grandfather started um, a small bookshop in what was then a refugee market. And so the word refugee was used very often. And... Um, I think for me, I, I never realized that I had to ask the questions in order to receive answers. And eventually, over time, I think it, I want to say it's with the 70th anniversary of partition that a real shift can be seen in younger people looking towards the past. And maybe part of it has to do with what Anam has said already so eloquently that time is running out and we are really... Uh, living amongst the last generation of partition witnesses and younger people are realizing that. And of course, social media, while it has so many um, terrible things about it online where it makes othering almost second nature to so many people, it also has incredible uh, offerings in terms of connecting people in borderless spaces. Social media is borderless. So whether it is people geotagging or hashtagging the spaces where their grandparents have come from on Instagram, saying, let me see what it looks like right now, or even things like, you know, that Google reunion ad, 
like why was it so emotional for people um in 2013 there was an ad that google took out where um these two grandfathers were essentially reconnected by their grandchildren and it was a great ad for google but i think it was the first time that someone on the other side of the border was not seen as the other and you know cinema has that power it has sometimes it has power more than books will because it it visually shows you that things are similar and people look similar and i think in part um this is what younger people are realizing as well that oh the person on the other side speaks the same language or eats the same food and i, I want to bring up a few little really odd things from my interviews that uh people discovered while they were kind of excavating their past the, the one thing that came out very often is um the fact that punjab was divided so i think in the indian consciousness and this is where you know you really see how conversations about partition are so indocentric that of course punjab was divided at the time of partition but in the national consciousness of indians punjab is so centric to the indian nation that we don't even consider half of it being in the larger half in fact being in pakistan and so you know a, a young interviewee uh, in his you know late teens is like mujhe pata hi nahi tha i didn't know that punjab was on the other side too similarly another interviewee says to me that um, in the 70s when my mother went to london she went with a friend and there were a group of pakistanis and uh, her parents had migrated at the time of partition and she did not want the pakistani to know what they were talking about so they spoke in punjabi and to which i said well young pakistanis speak far better punjabi than young indians do you know so he says yes but this this was how limited as as anam said the limited knowledge of uh, indians had of pakistanis and pakistanis have of indians that even if we meet face to face we may not even know you know we may not even know we even counted a punjabi and then of course the great paradox that when we do meet in places that are far removed from our border where we are far less territorial of our nationalities we find ourselves melting into one another you know and there is so much joy and and oneness and we celebrate we revel in that and it's just such a unexplainable thing is a really unexplainable thing the one last uh, anecdote i want to share about this is i recorded this story in pakistan many years ago where a lady said that part of her family had remained in india and part had migrated to pakistan and uh, her uh, puppy her bua was uh, in maharashtra in india and she was coming to lahore to meet everyone and so the children of the family this is when the lady was quite young and she says the children of the family were all discussing ke what is an indian like and you know uh, we didn't know anything and the only thing they knew was what the currency looked like the notes and they had seen that the ashoka pillar has four lions and so when their aunt came from maharashtra to to lahore um this this woman who was at the time a young girl looked at her and then she looked to the side and she looked to the other side and said well where are the rest of your heads because she assumed that indians had four heads because she nobody told her that they were once the same people you know and uh, i always think about this and how little we really because of these national contra, uh, constructs and national histories and how they are put, sort of drilled into us without even realizing that we go on autopilot you know almost uh, this is what we come up with right thanks so much for sharing those stories uh, anjal that's really illustrative of you know what you're talking about about you know how we don't know about the other we construct the other in such a different way freud talks about something called the narcissism of small differences we are so alike that we want to hold on and you know so you know so do that boundary work uh, but but yeah that's really illuminating um and i'm going to stick stay with you anjal um and you talked about this in in answering this question you talked about how uh, you know with the you know there there's more curiosity about the partition now among the younger generation we also see i don't really have the statistics for this i don't even know if there are statistics but if you were to compare oral history projects between pakistan and india 
there seems like there are many more oral history projects coming out of India and Indian identified diasporic or immigrant communities. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on, uh, you know, why that might be. And the, the second part of that question is there are similarities in narratives between Indians and Pakistanis. Uh, and I'm sure there are differences as well. So anything that you discovered in terms of differences and similarities between narratives or oral histories of Indians and Pakistanis that you'd like to share with us? That's a really great question. And I don't know if I, I fully have an answer for the first part of your question, but it is it is true, sadly. Um, and I'm reminded of something that Dr. Sara Ansari said in a, in a piece once where she said that one of the... Um, unforeseen consequences of the creation of Pakistan was how homogenized the population became there because it had been anticipated that there would be far more minority population there as well. Uh, whereas in India, where several communities continue to exist, perhaps, um, I don't know, perhaps that is, is landscape for, I don't know actually where I'm going with this. I don't know if I have a, I have a good enough answer for your question. But it is worth considering, and I do think someone, maybe Anam will actually have a better answer for this. Um, but to your other question about the differences and similarities uh, between Indian narratives and Pakistani narratives. So at the beginning of my field work, I concentrated mostly in India, uh, starting in Delhi, going to Punjab, then going to parts of UP, and then south, Hyderabad, Bangalore. Um, and then I went to Pakistan. And the conversations were quite different there because um, I think partly because I was the other there. And the conversations in India, if we, and they're different when you talk of Punjab and when you talk of Bengal, because the circumstances of the creation of the border and also the fortification of the border were actually quite different. So where on the Eastern side, um, the border was so malleable for years where there were migrations back and forth across the border between 47, 71, and e even as late as 93 or, or even recently, I think people had a far more deeper connection to the land and they were able to access it. But on the Punjab side, where the creation of the border was not only stark, but it was violent and it was sudden and there, there came a sort of, uh, it was really very, very fortified very quickly. Um, I think that loss is also so gravely held on to and the conversation remains largely about nostalgia and longing. And of course, bitterness. There is a lot of bitterness, there is anger, um, and there is pain. But but I think loss and pain perhaps extends to Pakistani interviews as well. But I think the one thing I wasn't expecting that I have, um, when I started interviewing in Pakistan is... Uh, how each of my interviewees spoke about things that were political and the cause of Pakistan and the creation of Pakistan and the uh, reception of Pakistan, a, a land for them. And um, I think uh, you need time with interviewees to arrive at aspects of loss and longing because it's, it's very possible, it may sound weird, but it's very possible for interviews on partition to contradict themselves within the same interview as well. Conversations can be contradictory, they can be complex because humans are complex beings and um, we don't remember in chronological fashion. Memory is sporadic, it is also not a recording device, it can is privy to change, it is pliable, malleable, uh, events of the present day impact it as well. And so um, I think I was very surprised. I remember the first time it happened, it was a gentleman who was speaking about how his entire family worked for the Muslim League in uh, UP in India. And when partition happened, none of them could get themselves to leave uh, because people from their family had been buried in India. People were married in India. And so there were ties to land there. However, this gentleman <clears throat> did leave. He went to Pakistan and he says that I made my life in this independent country that I had fought for. And just when I thought that was the end of our conversation, I think about two hours into it, he said, but who can prevent the memory of a homeland resurfacing? Who can separate one from the land of their birth? And I just wasn't expecting that. 
And I think maybe Anam can illuminate a little more on that because uh, it is something that, uh, because I remember thinking at the time, how deep has that feeling been buried in your heart? And you, you have to allow it to exhume itself. And so I think that's perhaps where the distinction, in my opinion, is. Right. Thank you so much, Anjil. And and I know these are, you know, these are these are difficult questions, right? And we're sort of constantly grappling with them. So we're just sort of having a conversation and we're not looking for, you know, exact or correct answers, right? So your thoughts are, you know, your thoughts are what I'm most curious to hear about and what you discovered in your research. Uh, so Anam, yeah, I, I, again, if you have any thoughts about <clears throat> why, might, why might there be more projects coming out of India rather than Pakistan and the Pakistani diaspora and again your thoughts on the similarities and differences between Indians and Pakistanis. Thanks Shruti. I, I also I mean my answer is going to be from a layperson perspective uh, because I don't really fully know. I think it is a it is an interesting question. I think on some uh, level there is a lot of really interesting work happening in Pakistan. I just don't know if it always gets uh, the mileage it, it should like um, I know that the Citizens Archive has been working on recording these partition stories since 2008, um, you know, some of the earlier work. Um, I know that, you know, Dr. Farooq Khan at LAMS has done some incredible work. Uh, Ahmed Saleem, who's a poet and activist, has been doing some incredible work. Uh, I also know that with the 1947 Partition Archive, they have a lot of young Pakistani researchers, both in the diaspora and in Pakistan. Some of my friends have been involved. So I definitely, I, I wouldn't say, you know, that work is not happening or that curiosity is not there. I think it very much is there. I, I do wonder, though, if it's also a question of resources and funding um, and how uh, when we talk about partition, um, it the first place we might often think about is India, um, because, you know, it's the partition of India, it's referred to. I try to be very careful and I always say partition of British India, um, because India, as we know it should, today, is as new <laughs> and modern of a nation state as Pakistan, right? Uh, the geography is completely altered. It is a post-partition, post-colonial, uh, in that sense, state. Um, but I don't think it's always perceived in that way. So pre-partition legacy and in partition itself um, kind of gets associated, it is seen as this breakup of India, right? And so I think a lot of international media and resources and grants sometimes get channeled there as well, whereas Pakistan's uh, international narrative is so centered around terrorism and fundamentalism um, and associating those kind of stories. Um, so I think it's also about like what are people curious about and what do they think about when they imagine these places? Um, this is really, I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of guessing over here. But so I think there is that. I also think, though, it's something that you both have touched upon um, that for Pakistan, partition has a very different meaning, right? Um, it is very much about nation making. It is very much also about triumph. Um, and partition stories can often get lost in that. It is uh, about independence, not necessarily from the British, because we don't focus enough on colonial history. So young children would often say, you know, 14th August is about partition or separation or independence from uh, quote unquote Hindu India because religion and nationalism have become so synonymous in people's minds over the years, and I also wonder if some of that uh, hesitation or, or you know, if if you're not seeing as much work also because of those larger narratives within Pakistan, too of you know what do we talk about or what does 47 really symbolize or represent? I can share a personal anecdote where I was invited um, at, on a panel to speak about Pakistan in in Islamabad and you know just days before I was told oh no don't talk about partition talk about independence and I really don't know how to do either or without <laughs> the other essentially right um, I think somewhere the the violence of partition also gets couched as sacrifice for nation making it gets almost glorified in that sense so I think all of those realities are there and the kind of shape what we are seeing or not seeing. Um, in terms of similarities and differences, I also think that the same state narrative of triumph versus loss in India uh, has an impact on what is shared at the personal level. I've talked a little bit about this in the book as well. 
I noticed that in Pakistan, you know, the violence was at the tip of the tongue for many people. And the stories of nostalgia and longing took longer to emerge. And I think it's, uh, my understanding is that, does that make you sound unpatriotic in some way? Because you're supposed to be, you know, joyous about the nation making, right? And so if you're saying my dying wish to, is to go across one last time and recover what I lost, does that make you not nationalistic enough, right? Is there space for those stories to emerge? And when I was in India, I noticed that those stories emerge much faster. And I think that again has to do with the larger narrative that the motherland was broken. And, um, you know, uh, it's often projected as broken at the hands of Muslims. I mean, the pre-partition past is far more complicated than that. We don't talk enough about, you know, Congress and, and Muslim League politics at that time and Hindu nationalism. But we have these very simplistic uh, narratives and understanding. So in, in India, you, you see those stories emerging much more quickly. But fascinatingly, some of my pa Pakistani partition survivors were a little annoyed by that, too, they said, you know, when we meet our Indian friends, they're always saying, they're always talking about um, how sad they are about this, but they don't realize that Pakistan means something very important to us. It is nation making, right? So, um, so somewhere, I think, because of what state is constantly kind of reinforced and repeat, personal memories and recollections will also kind of reinforce those aspects. If you sit with them longer enough, of course, you'll find all kinds of stories and a lot of similarities, right? You, you, I, I've sat down with Indian partition survivors and they've talked about the violence and I've sat down with Pakistani partition survivors and they've talked about that loss and those feelings are so shared. But what emerges more quickly or faster or what is seen as you know, the story that you should tell or you're allowed to tell varies depending on what those national stories Thanks so much, Anand. There's, there's again, there's there's so much to uh, unpack there, and I think w w a lot of what you st said made a lot of sense, right? In terms of why this might be, and in terms of you know how India is seen as this motherland that's been broken up, and certainly not realizing, uh, you know, the the birth of the new nation state for Pakistan that sort of gets sidelined or ignored. Uh, so a lot of what you said said made a lot of sense, and uh, again, you give you've given me a lot to think about. Um, I'm going to stay with you, Anam, and talk about just shift gears a little bit uh, and talk about um, something sort of. So we've been talking about the significance of oral history projects and memory projects, right? Is there anything in terms of uh, you know downsides of memory projects that that you'd like to talk about? And both of you've talked about you know uh, how it's difficult. These are difficult conversations. These are conversations about suffering and loss, and so we know that it's not easy, but but is it a mostly helpful process or any other downsides that you'd like to talk about of doing these memory projects? So I'll stay with you, Anam, and then I'll go on to Archie. Sure. I think that's a really, really important question. I do believe that sharing can lead to healing. I know that a lot of partition survivors speak of that too. Like we've never really shared the story and now we are, and it gives it an importance. Um, as Anshul said earlier, it can be really empowering to tell your own story in your own words. So there are all these beautiful things that can emerge out of that storytelling. But I don't think we talk enough about the ethics of doing this work. right? And I think it's essential to talk about that because you are talking about trauma memories and trauma stories. Right. And sometimes the urgency to push for a story for a researcher or a journalist can take precedence over the sensitivity and ethics of doing this work. Right? I know that a lot of young people are curious and that is that is so heartening to see. But alongside that, I think we need more work and more, you know, uh, webinars and, and just uh, kind of conversations around how do you do this in a way that is ethically sound because what I've learned over time, and this has been a learning and learning experience for me as well. I mean, I wrote my the partition book when I was 24. It came out a few years later. I was very young. So there's been a lot of learning for me. But I think one of the things that has really um, caught my attention is the importance of silence. Sometimes we think that only the verbal or what is being said or the narration is important. But I actually think that the non-narration 
the silence, the nonverbal, the body language is as important, if not more, right, than what is being said. And it's very critical to respect that and tune into that. You can't simply go and ask people what happened. It can be a very intrusive question. So how do you build that relationship? And how do you ensure that your questions or your preconceived notions, because we all have them when we walk in, all of us do, they don't overshadow and take over how a person wants to share and what they want to share. And it's, it's something I've had to really learn. Like when I enter that room, I may have thoughts and ideas about you know, what I would like to ask. But end of the day, it is only what the interviewee wants to share with me that is important for me to record. And if there are places that they don't want to go, I really need to respect that. I think the other thing uh, that we need to keep in mind is that firstly, there's no one kind of story that's going to emerge. And because of how partition is told in the larger narratives, we've been talking about that you know, all morning, uh, I think there can be a certain expectation of like, why are we not getting to the real story? I'll, I'll, I'll share very you know, honestly, when I first started doing this work, um, and people would be talking about these rescue stories about joint festivities, I would think, oh, that's a really interesting story. But when are we going to get to the real part of the interview? Because for me, partition was so associated with that violence, right? And of course, that emerged in most of the interviews. But uh, there were also other realities. And I had to, you know, kind of hear my interviews again and look at my transcriptions and say, where am I rushing somebody into a direction? Or where am I not pausing or tuning into what they are saying? Right? So I think that is, is really critical. Uh, you kind of need to reflect on your own process. Uh, when you come home, when you you know walk away from an interview, um, and you need to be really really mindful that people uh, have the right to their story, and and really mindful of the fact that you get to leave, and they don't. Right? This is not a story. This is their reality, and I think this becomes even more complex when we're talking about trauma, which in some ways is is ongoing and present. So if you're doing this work, for example, in Kashmir. It has a very different meaning because then it's not something that's been left behind at all in that sense. It's present day reality. So if you're pushing somebody to go to a place, are you also pushing them to um, dismantle their defense mechanisms, whether that is desensitization, right, or deflection or whatever that defense mechanism may be, which is helping them survive? So I think all of these things are really, really critical to keep in mind as we do this work and, and uh, you know, just being mindful not to rush people and also being mindful to not try to bring coherence where there may be much more fractured and fragmented utterances because that's how trauma memories kind of emerge. And that's the, that's the work of a writer and an oral historian because the way the story will be told to you is very different from how you might write it. Right. And, and, you know, when we're writing, of course, we're trying to build a, bring in a certain kind of coherence of flow. But we also have to be honest to how that story emerged in the first place and and not try to fill in those gaps, because sometimes it is those gaps and those pauses that are most telling in terms of what can still not be said. Thank you so much, Anand. That's so, so important. And I'm so glad that we are having this conversation on a public forum like this, where it's not just academics and specialists, but it's all sorts of people who are listening to you know, this and the importance of the ethics of this, the, power, the, un, the imbalance between the interviewee and the interviewer, right? Uh, not just uh, focusing on what the story is, but how you are going about it, being respectful of you know, various things and the importance of silence, just understanding silence as a language, but you've, you've raised a lot of really important things. And uh, like I said, I'm really glad that we're having this conversation, um, you know, for a wider audience. Um, Anshul, I'm going to ask you the same question about, you know, any downsides that you see. And I think, I think if I remember correctly, <clears throat> you do address some of this, you know, the ethics of doing this. You've addressed it in various interviews. If you've, you've also written about it, uh, but what would you like to add or, you know, just, you know, um, reinforce what Anam said? I think I, I was nodding so hard uh, when Anam was speaking because these are things that, you, I mean, these are things you have to learn over time, but also things you realize about yourself. Um, the impatience of youth, 
you know i remember writing in my first book where um i came into an interview uh, with somebody and my all my questions were about partition initially and she was like we'll get there we'll get there um i think the first thing is to realize and acknowledge that even if someone has agreed to speak with you they don't have to speak to you even though they may know that the conversation will be about partition that may not be a subject they want to approach just yet or at all or at all you know i think that's that's something you have to learn the hard way and you have to um, be very mindful of um i think for me i will share an anecdote uh, and it actually very much resounds um, what anam has uh, said uh, i have been speaking to my paternal grandmother for nearly 8 or 9 years about partition and i think when i started i was 23 I was, you know, very, very audacious when we ask questions at a young age. We don't really understand the consequences of the question sometimes. And so, my question to her was, um, I think we had been speaking about something else. And I asked her that, you know, do you think that if after partition there had been people like me or um, journalists or someone going around the camps because they lived in camps, going around camps asking people, do you want to talk? How does it feel? what did you see what did you lose who did you lose what happened do you think he would have wanted to speak to them and she she was very quick to say no and i had assumed that she would say no because it was so soon after partition and so i i didn't expect her to say yes because i think you do need a bit of time to uh reflect on what you've experienced which is why anam's comment about ongoing conflict whether it be in kashmir or the northeast or really any other part of the world um when you're within it it's it's very hard to look from outside to the inside and so she said no no i wouldn't want to speak to anyone and i thought that's what she would say that you know we had just lived through something so traumatic how could i talk about it what would i say there was nothing to say but what she said was well i was 16 years old what would i know about this partition so even even having experienced it there is confusion about what has happened you cannot make sense of what you have lived through what you have seen but then she said you know maybe my mother would have wanted to speak because she was older she was a single mother she had to take care of children she had a lot of burdens maybe it would have helped her unburden and then when i thought the conversation was over she said something else which i really didn't expect she said that you know like you ask me questions now sometimes i don't want to answer them because you ask me questions and i answer because you want to know and then you leave and i return to that time and i'm still in that time and it stays with me and then i got thinking that how many times in the last 8 or 9 years have i asked her to become that 16 year old girl again describe the trains again describe how her brother died soon after partition again describe the camp the food having no money having to beg for money having to get a job at the age of 17 again and again and again and she was right and and as anam said we can leave and we have the privilege of knowing that these are stories that we may become embroidered in but they don't really belong to us even though we have unearthed them we hear these stories once twice maybe 10 times in our transcriptions but people are living with these stories again and again and so i was very conflicted when i heard that from my own grandmother because somewhere along her story begins my story and i don't know i i didn't really quite know how to answer that because i was partly surprised partly hurt and then i said well would you rather i not ask these questions and she was very quick to say yes and then very quick to say no of course you should ask because if you don't ask who will ask and i think over the years she has realized that her story may go unrecorded because there is always more to the story there is and, th- and this is what surprises me that there is always more there will always be something that remains unsaid that may be shared later that for which the time is not now you know so um i very much echo anam's thoughts 
the other thing that um, I think a lot about with doing work on partition is how unfairly the Punjab partition has been written about how extensively uh, as compared to not just Bengal, but other, other partitions uh, and ongoing um, conflicts that have emerged from partition, whether it is the Northeast of India, uh, places like Assam, or um, even uh, Operation Polo in Hyderabad, or the princely states, or Kashmir, where the far or, or Rajasthan and Sindh, uh, and even then aspects of caste and class that enter into partition history that need uh, more scholarship to emerge. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, and again, thanks a lot for sharing that ane anecdote, um, uh, Anshul. Both of you are, are such wonderful storytellers. It's just so engrossing to talk to both of you with, you know, your 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 stories as well as, you know, uh, your, your thoughts and analysis of it. Uh, but you're right in terms of, you know, there's an excess, right? There's always an excess. There is always something that's going to be left unsaid because these are difficult, traumatic experiences. And, and so important to keep so much of this in mind as we're doing this work. Uh, we're, we're getting close to the end. I'm, I'm just going to ask you one quick question, and then I'm going to take up audience questions, which I think we have a few of these here already. Uh, but, uh, you know, you've talked about, uh, you know, your, you, you've both done work with, uh, you know, work across the border with Indians pa uh, and Pakistanis, respectively. Uh, but would, what would you like to share about what you've learned about India and uh, and Indians and Pakistan and Pakistanis in the process of doing this work? So I'm going to start with you, Anam, if you'd like to share what you've learned about India, uh, you know, Indians, and of course, you know, it's a very diverse group. There are many splits within this. So, you know, I'm I'm sorry that I'm homogenizing, uh, but what would you like to tell us? And how has your work of memory, you know, this the, these oral history projects, how have they changed how you think and feel about the India-Pakistan border? So, Anam, if you can please get uh, share your thoughts. Sure. So I, I grew up knowing very little, right? I mean, uh, I think you get access to India uh, more so than you do to Pakistan if you're in India because of Bollywood. So I grew up with Bollywood. And I always say that, you know, in my imagination growing up, India then became this quote unquote exotic enemy <laughs> because on one hand, you love the songs and, and you love the, the actors and the movies. And at the same time, we're talking about war and, and jingoism. I did grow up, you know, in the late 80s, 90s. Um, of course, you know, there's so much happening, this violence in Kashmir happening, and, and there's so much talk about war at that time as well. So it was this very um, strange relationship. But I was I was always very curious. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think it was only once I went across, once I started doing th this work that I began to really understand the similarities. I first met Indians, like many of us, in a third country setting in UK and then in Canada. And it just felt like, the, you know, we spoke the same language and talked about the same things. Um, and and that's where, where I thought, OK, maybe, you know, we can move away from partition and um, we can we can rebuild our own relationships, which I think is partially true. But when I went to India, it was a more complicated understanding on one hand. Yes, absolutely. It helps you deconstruct those monster images and that enemy, enemy construction. But at the same time, it shows you that because of how the histories we have grown up with are so different, right? We also have a lot more messiness in our present day relationships that is important to navigate and acknowledge. So I think one of the things I've gotten more comfortable with is our uncomfortable past and being able to sit with uncomfortable questions and have uncomfortable conversations, which is I think as important as those beautiful conversations that emerge when Indians and Pakistanis are in the same room, right? I think that the two kind of need to go hand in hand. Um, but I've uh, also, I think, learned to reimagine borders in a very different way as a result of my work. Because fascinatingly, this is something I did not expect, but a lot of uh, families that I, were, I was speaking with were talking about reconnecting and reuniting at the border. Now, for me, the border has always been the Vaga border, right? And it, it feels very hostile um, and divisive and then the armies. But if you travel across, 
most borders are not porous at all anymore but um you know there might be a row of plants or something like a very small marker which is telling you that this is now not your territory um and you you know there are many people who accidentally cross over we we hear about the stories all the time and that kind of shows you the absurdity of this division right but also the possibilities so uh, for example in in kashmir uh, the line of control in many parts is just the neelam or the kishanganga river and i've spoken with families who are divided and during the winter months when the when the water kind of shrinks um in the past before social media they've actually sat on both sides of the river and spoken to each other right i've uh, interviewed people who uh, were able to actually catch a glimpse of their family at the border um i you know the the story i was talking about earlier about the border in kasur um and then the family that i met with um you know i was i was interviewing the son and he he told me that his father was able to see his sick brothers at the border at a festival that happens or used to happen at least in kasur at the shrine which is on the zero line uh where hindu sikhs and muslims come together right every year so there are also stories like that which has helped me kind of deconstruct my own notions and um yeah i think i think there's so much so much of that um that i've learned and i've unlearned and i continue to uncover and then as the other thing that you said i think i've also realized how big india is and you know when i was i think i was doing my first trip i was working on this partition book and i was in a jnu in delhi and i was with a group of young students and i kept asking them these questions about what they think about pakistan and what they think about partition till finally this one student kind of got up and she said can i be really honest we don't really think much um i'm from the south and this doesn't have the same relevance and it doesn't just we just don't have the same frictional relationship and i think that is also a really important reality check because when we imagine india as a pakistani you also imagine a particular part of india particular language particular culture right um and there's so much more to both of these lands and places that tends to get lost right thank you so much so you you so just like you're adding nuance to the story of partition your understanding of borders boundaries and what it means to be these nation states it's getting more nuanced as well and i loved what you said about the absurdity but also possibilities of of borders and boundaries um anshul i have the same question for you so if you want to talk about what you learned about pakistan and pakistanis in the process and how your relationship with the india pakistan border changed in the process and and like anam reminded us there is not just this one border right there are many different kinds of borders and many in 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 terms of numbers to there many many borders so yeah but i you know i don't want to start by just uh, giving a small fact about the vaga border um in india we have grown up calling it the vaga border that's the thing that is most common but in fact vaga is in pakistan and the village on the indian side is the atari village so it is vaga atari or atari vaga and this name was officially changed only as recently as 2012 uh because for all of our lives we were saying the word vaga you know children are saying vaga border vaga border without realizing vaga is in pakistan um i am also reminded of this this book that a uh, novelist wrote where she had something very profound um where she said it was a love story between an indian and a pakistani and she said that one of the characters had fallen in love with a pakistani as an indian and uh, she was thinking is hating pakistan the same as hating all pakistanis and is hating india the same as hating all indians and of course when you meet that singular person from india or pakistan that belief really changes because they are more similar to you than you would have expected often more similar in my case than most of my own countrymen in terms of linguistic geographic uh family structure food things like that um when i went to pakistan for the first time i think the the best thing that i did in my opinion which was quite mature of me at the time despite being 24 was to enter the country with an open mind i think if i would have gone with fear or preconceived notion now i think in retrospect that was actually incredibly mature because i 
I didn't really have any preconceived notions. And everyone was very afraid for me. And the only people that were so excited were my immediate family. My parents, my grandparents, my grandparents' siblings. In fact, my, grand, uh, my mother was like, shall I meet you in Pakistan? Shall I try and get a visa and meet you there? Because I was coming from Canada at the time. And of course, when you are in Pakistan, there are things that you don't expect. And I suspect maybe this has to do with divided families, that maybe Pakistan is very open to receiving Indians because of the number of people from India that visit to meet their family. And so when you are there as an Indian, people treat you no different than they would here in India. They are very kind. And I think I spend a lot of my days defending Pakistanis to Indians, saying that you need to meet one. You, mean, you need to talk to one. But then there are also really absurd things that happen. Like, for instance, um, maybe Anam has heard this story about my manicure in Pakistan, where this lady is doing my manicure in the in the basement of the Gymkhana in Lahore. And uh, she says, oh, Bibi, to see kaha se ho? Like, where are you from? Are you from Islamabad? Are you from Karachi? And I said, well, actually, I'm from Delhi. I'm Delhi. Se and she drops my hand and her voice goes very low. And she's looking around and she says... Um, to see Bharat se ho, you're from Bharat. And I think for me, the incongruence between a modern India and a Hindu Bharat is also something I grapple with. So I said, no, no, I, I'm from India. Yes, I'm from India. And so then the questions began. And I thought the questions would be about politics. And, and I was fully prepared to be like talking about partition and Kashmir. And, but the questions were, why do you look like us? Can you say something in Hindi? Where is your jewelry? Because they all watch Star Plus serials. Where is your sindoor? And when I explained that only married women wear sindoor, how do you put on sindoor? Where is your sari? Oh, tell me how much do potatoes cost in India? How many times a week do you eat meat? These were the questions she wanted to know because she was fully unprepared to meet someone who looked, spoke, dressed, exactly like her, who had the same preoccupations as like, yes, onions are very expensive in India also. What do I do? You know? Um, and it's very similar to the how many heads do you have, where are the rest of your heads kind of story that there is so little that common people know. And I think that really, like, that experience was very telling. But I also think that in doing this work, this oral history work with common people, we are partially bridging trying to bridge that gap at least. We are trying to show people that yes, maybe the language that your grandparents spoke and left behind is a language that's still spoken across the border. Yes, the panjiri that you eat in winter is still eaten there as well. It may not be eaten around you or the, the sira that you're drinking or the achar or you know things that are so culturally fundamental to us can be found across the border. Um, a novelist that I interviewed for my recent book whose grandparents came from uh, what is now Pakistan. And Partition finds space in his work often, either through background or in conversation with his characters. And he said something very interesting. He said that it is so weird to realize that your inspirations come from places that you have not even seen, but are a part of your genealogy, of your identity, and have been passed down even not through visuals by any means, because his family didn't speak about partition, but through the knowledge that they have lived through something. And it inadvertently sort of this hypnosis that happens in fiction that allows you to navigate landscapes of the past is so prevalent in his work. And I thought that was incredible how his inspirations were coming from places that were inaccessible. That's what he said, inaccessible across the border. Thank you so much, Angel, again, for sharing those stories. And, you know, like I said before, you, these are your discoveries and your consciousness is sort of shifting as you're doing this work, but you're doing a massive public service and also in terms of, you know, making this consciousness or shifting this consciousness uh, for an entire generation. So, yeah, um, we're, we're out of time, but it, we have quite a few questions. Um, I, asked, uh, I asked Anam already, so maybe if we can go on for another five or 10 minutes. Is that okay with you, Anjal? 
is, is five minutes is fine. It's 10 p.m. here. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know the time difference. So maybe just five or seven minutes. Um, so we have quite a few questions here, and I'm just going to go uh, ask them in the order in which people send them. So Navneet from Maine uh, writes, how do we reconcile written and oral history? The narrative we learn and what actually happened, how do we trust written history and how do we heal? Those are a lot of, uh, you know, big, uh, heavy questions. So um, maybe, you know, just addressing any part of any small part of that um, and any one of you can take it up. I'm just happy to very quickly say that I think that we don't need to see the two as mutually exclusive, firstly. Um, and we also need to keep in mind that history is not written in the most objective of ways. History is always written from a vantage point. Um, and that's where oral history and more conventional sources of history can really complement and supplement each other and also challenge each other in very critical ways. Um, and the two need to perhaps be seen hand in hand because they enrich, they don't take away from, from each other. That's great. I, I just very quickly want to add, um, I've, I've noticed that often people think archival sources are truth, right? Um, but it's one version of the truth written by one perspective. Like all the archives we have are often from British perspectives. That's just one truth. So why are we doubting these innumerable truths that we have recorded that are helping us gain more insight into the past? There is no one truth. There is space, as Anam said, for multiple sources to coexist. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so the next question is from VK Singh uh, from Ann Arbor, Michigan. And he says, trauma healing can only occur through a mixture of legal, political justice, as well as through psychological counseling, talk therapy, spiritual practices. Like Anjan mentioned, South Asian culture does not even have a vocabulary for trauma that itself is not stigmatized. How do we begin a healing process for today's generation or generations when many are denied the tools of healing that I described above? Again, any or both of you can take it up. I think the first thing I'd uh, like to uh, say something that Anam said uh, early on in the conversation is that partition and uh, any event, 71 also, has different consequences and understandings. Public consciousness is perceived differently for all three different nations. Uh, and so when you have events that have been lived by three nations, but there is no shared understanding of them, um, perhaps the first step is acknowledging that one may have a differing opinion or uh, feeling about this before thinking about reconciliation, you know, truth and reconciliation come in an order and there is needs to be an acknowledgement of truth, not only within your own nation, but with your neighbors as well, because it concerns them too. So I think that kind of process has not happened. I don't know when and how it will happen, but first truth needs to be vocalized and acknowledged. And then we think of any form of reconciliation. I just the only thing I want to add to that is I think that if we I completely agree with what Anshul said and if we want to move towards any kind of healing I think we need more and more focus on the human dimension of these larger meta macro events wars uh, that have happened um, so we need to center on people's stories and people's experiences and that's where we'll find also connection we can move beyond this is my national story or your national story and feeling very territorial about it um to just kind of center on the on the humanness of this experience right um we have two more questions but i'm also afraid that it's going to take much longer because these are also they, these are great questions there's a question about you know you know what is it like to for you to do this work and you know how does it sort of you know create take an emotional toll on you uh, there's another question about the relationship between individual and collective memory these are all great questions and i wish we had more time to get to them but i'm going to you know in the interest of time and uh, you know 
both Anam and Anshul have busy schedules, and Anshul is also in a different, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's almost time for bed for Anshul. So I'm going to wrap this up. I'm so grateful to both of you uh, for joining us today. I've learned so much, and I feel so privileged that I got this opportunity to have this conversation with you. And I hope that, um, you know, you know, I hope. I'm really looking forward to your future work and I wish you all the best. I'm sure all of us wish you all the best. And I hope that we'll have another opportunity to have a conversation like this soon. So thank you so much. I'm going to hand it back to uh, Manvinder. Amazing. Thank you so much. Again, I know we're on a tight schedule, so I'll keep my, um, my closing a little bit short as I've been a part of this conversation. It was so lovely to learn with everyone in the audience. Um, I think it really made me think about individualism, uh, individualism, homogeneity, and then thinking about syncretism um, and how these create um, fulfilling stories and different subjectivities. So I think it really reinforced the importance um, of storytelling for me, which I sometimes get bogged down in, uh, like what is the importance of an individual narrative? I think it's because it creates that collective narrative uh, and that collective memory that we that we keep and gets passed down in different narratives. Um, I'm really reflecting on the words around silence and what gets missed in silence. Of course, thinking of uh, Urvashi Batali as the other side of silence, which was really fundamental in my understanding of partition. Um, and in thinking about that last question, like why don't we have a word for trauma? Who gets to have a word for trauma? And why did they get that word? Um, and then really thinking about, um, yeah, kind of that trauma-informed lens when conducting interviews. Um, how does that get created? Um, and how do we work towards, yeah, better helping people share their narratives. Um, so yeah, just a big thank you to all of our panelists, to our great moderator today. I'll, um, yeah, I'll direct everyone's attention to Sikri's social media. Um, we are currently doing a series on narratives uh, that were present during 1947 uh, from different perspectives. So you can give us a follow on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Uh, again, thank you so much for tuning in today. As always, a recording of this webinar will be available within 24 hours. Uh, thank you for joining today. Today's webinar will be ending now. Vaigujika Khalsa, Vaigujiki Fateh.